Second Chronicles chapter 15. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Odid, and he went out to meet Asa. And he said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. That's the southern tribes again. The Lord is with you. Be great if the Lord could say that to us. The Lord is with you. While ye be with him. There's a condition when it comes to the Lord being with you. Now we've read in the book of Genesis about uh, a man and a woman that God talked with them and walked with them all during the day until they forsook God. And you'd be foolish to say that, oh, I follow God and God follows me and God hasn't walked with you in I don't know how many years. Because you forsook his way. God is not going to walk the road of unrighteousness. He'll stop when you make that decision and God will stay right there until you come back. And I've been in that situation. You live your entire life, you go in that one big circle and you end up right back where God is. And all you did was pick up heavy baggage. He didn't go nowhere. He didn't do nothing. While ye be with him. So the main condition of God being with you is the fact is you got to be with him. And ye, and if ye seek him, he will be found of you. And we already saw him in the last chapter. He, he's in a battle and he sought God and God came out and rescued him. That's the best thing to do. When you've got money problems, you've got financial problems, you've got family problems, you've got health problems, whatever you've got, it'd be great when you call upon God and say, God, I need your help. Now, we're not talking God's going to answer right away, but if you are in fellowship with God and you can say, and God can say, listen, yeah, you're walking with me, I'm walking with you, and then when you seek me, I will be found, I'll be there for you. That's a wonderful thing. Whereas, if you haven't walked with God, and you haven't done what God's told you to do, and then when you, that time you need him, he's not there, then trouble comes. And you've got to be careful, because guess what? Satan can be there. And Satan could be acting just like God in your life and fooling you. You could think it's God's blessings. You could think everything is of God living wrong. And all it is, the devil just keeps on uh, putting that cheese out there to one day you get snapped in the mousetrap. But, here's another Bible, but if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Plain and simple. Now, God does have mercy. God does have grace. God doesn't have to keep working in your life. God is a righteous and he's a holy God. And when we do step out of line and when we do go wrong, it's that loving Father, that loving God, the merciful and the, the, the blessful God, that he tries to get us back and tries to do us right. Any other religion God out there, would just that's it, just put you. But a Christian can be go so far, according to Paul, that your life could be end up in just early death, sickness, weak, because you haven't done what God told you to do. You know, when troubles come in our life, we're so quick to blame the devil, but it's not always the devil. It can be us. It can be the decisions we made. You got to be careful, because when we walk life, when we do that path, we're walking three ways. We're walking godly, we're walking satanic, and we're walking in self. And the three are very hard to distinguish. Just ask Job. God allowed the devil to do what the devil wanted to do to Job with certain conditions, but yet Job was self-righteous. Now, we've already seen victory in Asa's life because he had done what God wanted him to do. He had cleaned the place up. He had sought to God. Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the true God. 
A long season, how would that be? Since Solomon forsook the Lord for the other gods of his wives, of the nations, unto chapter 13. And what we had, uh, trying to remember now, we had King Rehoboam, uh, yeah, Rehoboam. We had, um, let's see, King Rehoboam. Abijah, and I believe Asa. So we've gone through two kings, three kings, count Solomon in a half, two and a half kings. While, while the Lord has not been there, they have not been seeking the true God of the Bible of uh, Israel because of sin. And uh, we'll go back now for a long season, Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest. Oh, you mean the Levites and the priests have not been doing their jobs? You know, there are churches today that they're not teaching like they're supposed to. We are in a long season without the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. And without law. So they haven't been following the law. They have not been obeying Moses' books. And... Without obeying the law, without doing what God told them to do, when they died, they went to hell. I don't care if they're Jews. Still, if they didn't obey what God told them to do, like you know, if today someone does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will go to hell, Jew or Gentile. Romans chapter 10. So how many people from, from the, the, the end of Solomon's life to chapter 13 with Asa... How many people have died without the law in the Old Testament, without the, the, the priests teaching what, doing what they're supposed to be doing at the temple, and without God being in it? This is the condition before Asa. So Asa brought about a revival. He brought about coming back to God. But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and saw him he was found of them even in their sin God said okay, you know God said enough is enough I'm going to show you mercy I'm going to show you grace I'm going to give you a little bit of light so you can come to me it's not by man it's all by God it's 100% God the only thing you had part of salvation was you rebelled against God that's your part in salvation. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. Now if you go back and read yesterday's chapter 14, verse 1 at the end of the verse, it says, in his days the land was quiet ten years. Well, what did we read in chapter 13? What did we read in chapter 12? There was civil war in Israel. There wasn't battling the Philistines. They weren't battling the Moabites. They were battling their brothers in a civil war, north versus south. Now, let me ask you a question. I mean, if this was a Christian nation, we had the same similar war in this country, north versus south, brother against brother. Maybe that's a possibility that that's when we forsook God. And then during a period that we had great revivals, we had, you know, a pouring out of the Spirit, people got saved, bars were closed, sin was put away, and now today it's advertised. And it's advertised in the church. Read some of the, those billboards. I'm going to say it again, I don't care if you don't like it. Any Bible Baptist church, any Baptist church that has Easter on their front sign as part of their service, that's, that's a foreign God. The Bible says you're not even to make mentions of those gods. By saying Easter, you're saying Ishtar, a God. And Asa put them out, put the gods away. Trash scanned them. And he got revival, he got peace. Vexations and uh, 
what's it say? No peace and vex great vexations, just troubles and problems. A nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with with all adversaries. And read again before chapter fourteen. Listen, even Solomon, he, he God rose up Jeroboam. God rose up this other man. God rose up people to go against Jeroboam. I mean, against Solomon for his sin because of the sin that he did. And Rehoboam, he had the whole nation. He had an opportunity to bring peace and do right in the nation, and he didn't. He disobeyed. He rebelled. And look what happened to him. He split the entire nation. Be ye strong, therefore. And let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. God's telling them, don't give up. Chapter 14 was pleasing to God. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed, the prophet, he took courage. Courage in the Lord. Not in your military strength, not in what you can do. It's all in the Lord. And put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin. He's in reform. He's, he's cleaning. You know what a revival is? Is when you clean, you get the junk out of your heart, of your home. Listen, if you get right by God and repent and take your sins and all the trash you got in your life, it will spread to other Christians and it will spread through the church and then it will spread more and more. Read the book of Acts, how the word of God grew, the Bible says. You say, why ain't we getting the revival today? Why ain't it growing? Because the church is nestled, it is in the bosom of Satan and the devil, the world, in the flesh. And it does not want to come out. Asa is taking a stand and getting rid of religion. He's getting rid of idols. And out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. So when he goes into a, a city to, and he conquers it, takes it over, he gets the gods out and puts God in. Have you taken the gods out of your family? Have you taken the gods out of your life and replaced them with God? What books do you read through the week? Where do you spend your time during the week? Is it for self? Is it for the world? Or is it for God? And renew the altar of the Lord. That was before the porch of the Lord. That's where they burnt, That's where they were supposed to bring the burnt offerings. Asa's got to renew it. He's got to set it back up. He's got to put it back in order. He's got to have it cleaned up. He's got to. He's got to have it sanctified. He's got to have it set apart for the Lord. It's probably got tumbleweeds against it. It's probably have to move all the dead branches and all that away from it so they can actually see it's there. The place of the sacrifice has been not removed, has been forsaken. And today you get Bibles that takes the blood out of the Bible. You have shut down the altar of the Lord on the porch. Because only by blood. Listen, those priests would have brought water. Which some people believe baptism. It only put that fire out. And you were not to have that fire put out. It's all about the blood. And too many churches. The blood is either just removed. Or it's just forgotten. And we don't want to talk about a bloody religion. We don't want to talk about Christ's blood. We don't want to bring Christ's blood. And guess what? Your altar has not been renewed. We can sing about the old rugged cross, but we can't think about the blood on it. We can say, I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Why don't you cherish the blood that was on it, not the wood? Yeah, I know what the cross represents, but what about the, the flesh 
What about the blood in the water? What about the scar tissue? What about it was the Savior that was on the cross and not the wood itself? I'll cherish Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. I'm not going to see the cross in eternity. But I'll forever think of the blood in eternity. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers, Gentiles. You want to ask Jonah and Peter about this one? Jonah was told to go to a, a city of, of the Ninevites to, to Gentiles, and he went the other way. Peter's on a housetop, and God tells him through a, a vision, I want you to go to unclean people. I want you to go to the Gentiles. And Peter's like, no, no, I've never touched anything unclean. Telling God what to do again. And he ends up in a Gentile house. Jonah ends up in a Gentile city, and both of them repented, and both of them got right. You know, in Cornelius' house in the city of Nineveh, it wasn't just one man that got saved. It was multitudes. It was a whole city. It was a whole family. This guy brings out the strangers. Let me ask you something, Christian. When was the last time you brought a stranger or invited a stranger out to your church to hear a message? Preacher, when was the last time you gave a message that would represent somebody in your congregation to bring, a, to bring a stranger and not just to make them feel good and good and plenty, but that their heart will weep, that they'll be under the burden of sin to realize they have a need for Jesus Christ and not to feel good and be patted on the back? Out of Ephraim and Manasseh, out of Simeon, for they, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with them. You know, when people see that God is with you, you'll touch lives. You'll change lives. You'll do what people really want you to do. They'll see in you the, the, authenticity, the, the truthfulness, the holiness. And you know what that's missing today? Because you know when you do something like I do and you witness to people, you hear people say, well, I know a Christian. I know a preacher that did this. And you ruined the testimony. The testimony of the church to the world today is a stink. It's a church that's not a vast virgin. It's a church that committed adultery. Listen, you got an age today when you get somebody who witnesses for Jesus, who wants to do right, and the people in the church turn against that person. And they don't help edify. They try to break down. Well, imagine we talked about wall cities yesterday. Imagine somebody trying to kill the people inside the wall city. Asa had, man, he, he his life, what he's doing is bringing people. They're gathering. They're coming out. They want to see what's going on. And you're getting people in the church today. They're coming to church, but it ain't, it ain't nothing of God because it's movies. It's, it's entertainment. It's having a good time. It's dinners. It's cake sales, it's bizarre, bizarre, that's the perfect word, bizarre, God would say, what is this, this ain't my church, it's a bizarre, read Revelation 3, in our church age, it makes God sick, he wants to vomit, but not Asa, they, hey, God is with you, has anybody ever came to you and said, you know what? There's something about you. You're weird. Maybe not in those words. Has people in your family turned away from you because of the God that you serve? Have other Christians turned away from you? All they that live godly shall suffer persecution. And I don't mean you be a Christian idiot. And you go make people hate you. That's stupid. That's an idiot. That's a fool. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem, where they're supposed to. The place where God put his name in the Old Testament. In the third month, that'd be about June. Our calendar's wrong. Our calendar is a Roman Catholic calendar. Roman calendar. With Roman holidays. 
with Roman names. You ever check it out? August, Augustine. You ever check the names out? You ever know what they mean? You do study, right? You do look up information. You do have the World Wide Web that you can just type in something and find out where to... You do do that, right? Or are you just lazy and sleepy? Huh? You're supposed to look things up. You're supposed to study, the Bible says, unless you have a perverted Bible. Come on, wake up! Smell the, the sweet offering of the incense of prayer. We'll get through this eventually. In the 15th year of the reign of Asa, 15 years, and Asa's still doing right. Now, in verse 14, it doesn't say when it started, but it says he, in his days he had quiet 10 years. Well, in chapter 14, we saw that there was an Ethiopian army that came up. And God gave them victory. And they offered unto the Lord the same time. You know what an offering is? An offering is a sacrifice. Something that you give of yourself. Something that you minus on your account and you give for God's account. Have you offered? Have you sacrificed? For God, in God's name, in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you given money, no time, self, of the spoil which they had brought? Where was that spoil? That was in chapter 14. Remember we finished that chapter? If not, go back and, and listen to the audio of Second Chronicles 14. Man, they, they, they were raiding. They, were, they got much from the Ethiopians. And what do they decide to do? Oh, we're going to keep it. We're going not. They're, they're going to give it to God. And if you hear that, that's that's a blessing of God, of rain and thunder and lightning. You always praise God for rain, because God can give you too much, or God can give you too little. So you're giving of God to spoil. They didn't have to. They could have kept it themselves, and many people do, and you'll come up short. Now watch this. They offered 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. God records what you give. What's his record book saying about you, my friend? What is your ledger? If there's something that the book of Numbers and Chronicles will record, it is record that God will record names and how much and what you do. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart. Now, they said in the covenant, they wanted to make a deal. They wanted to make a promise. They wanted to set themselves to love and to honor their God. Have you ever made a pact? Have you ever set a goal? Have you ever put the finish line in your life that when this time on this earth is done, it is going to be all for Jesus Christ and nothing else. Read 2 Timothy chapter 4 in the closing words of Paul. Is your goal Jesus? Now, we're all sinners. You're going to do things that you're going to lose a reward. And you're going to do things that are going to suffer a loss at the judgment seat of Christ. But is your main goal for Jesus? Or is it something else? These people have set their heart, all their heart, not half a heart, not a Sunday heart, not an Easter or Christmas heart. They set their heart truly to God to do right and to do what God wanted to do. Have you set your heart fully on God? Some of you out there set your heart foolishly to God with foolishness and God don't honor that and with all their soul do you know who controls your soul God does God has all right 
in eternity to proclaim your soul saved or lost based upon what God has set for you to obey or to reject. And God does not make you. He gives you a free will to choose. That whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death. Now look at that. Capital punishment for those who do not want to. Is it wrong? Is it right? It's recorded in Scripture. And God does not rebuke them. He said, oh, should we go kill? No. No, we're not in the Old Testament, remember? We are today to love our enemy, to love our neighbor. We are to love the brethren as Christ loved us. Too many people love the world and the, and the lost more than they love the brethren. You got to get that. You are to love your. You are to love the lost, yes, but you are to love the brethren more. And they used to put a documentation, put in a law that if you don't want to serve God, you're going to die. How serious was he? I'll tell you how serious he was. Show me. Oh wait a minute! It does say in the law that if people were to leave God, or to, to bring you to another God, and witches and all that in the Old Testament, if they were to forsake God and bring others, they were to die to death, means Asa is now back in the law of God. Asa is not going to tolerate rebellion. But yet, the Corinthian church had a man sleeping with his, fa his father's wife, no, something like that. I forget what it was. That was Reuben. But there was sin. There was a, 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 a fornication going on in the church in Corinth. And they were just allowing it. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, well. And Paul rebuked them as a carnal church. But yet we got churches today in America. We got churches that are fornicating and adulterizing themselves and sleeping with Satan <laughs> is it just fun what is this it's not that hey listen to me if you don't want to do right you don't want to get your your life right you don't want to do what God says to do you have the chance that you're going to be de-churched you won't be allowed here but you can't do that in America because if you de-church someone for having sins, they can go right down to the next block and go to the next church. And they'll be gladly and holy fire and thankfully put underneath the rug. So we can get your cash and your love and we can say how many people we had in church. And look at how many people are on the rolls of our church as members. Asa is serious. Whether small or great, whether man or woman. Hey, listen, he ain't putting out no pre prejudice. He ain't taking no, listen, anybody. As for me and my house, Joshua said. You know what Joshua says? He said, listen, son, if you don't want to do what God says to do, you get out of my house right now. Honey, if you don't want to do what God wants to do, you get out of my house right now. That's what Joshua meant. And Asa is saying, listen, you don't want to do right in Israel. You're going to lose your head. You better escape. And don't come back unless you do want to serve the God of this nation. We are going to serve God, and we're going to serve God right under the penalty of death. You say that's church and state. No, that's letting God do with a nation that God wants to do. That's getting rid of the riffraff. That's getting rid of the sin. That's giving God an opportunity to work and do right. It's so absent from the church and Bible preaching today. You think I'm a hypocrite. You think I'm a fool, and you are. It's a serious thing to serve the Lord. It ain't time for dances. It ain't time for fooling around. It ain't time for fun. 
You look at the lives of those apostles, you tell me when they had fun. And they swore unto the Lord with a loud voice. I got a loud voice. The only loud voice you get in the church today is bingo. Cut your hands. <laughs> All the kinds of nonsense. Why not get a preacher out of swing a fist now with the Bible sweat and spin and proclaiming the word as it is? You got petunias behind the pulpits today. You got little sissy little people today in America. You make fun of them. They're going to go get a lawyer. You fool. You jellyfish. You backless spine idiot. Get some guts. The Bible says, go ye to the world and preach the gospel. They may offend them. Wait till you find what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Those eyes and those nail pierced hands pointing at you as a loser. With a loud voice, with shoutings, with trumpets, with coronets. They are praising God with music. They are shouting hallelujah, amen. You can't do that in some churches today. You wake them up. You crawl to the store. He said, Amen. Oh, he is one of those weird people over there. We don't say that in our church. We're dignified. Holy, holy, full of baloney. And what did God think about it? What does God think? And all Judah rejoice at the oath. They rejoice. There's rejoicing. There's praising God. There's hallelujah. There's amen. There's glory. I'm happy serving the Lord. And they had sworn with their heart. All their heart. It wasn't a half sworn. It wasn't, you know, cross your fingers, stand on one toes, an eyeball and all. Well, it was serious. We are going to serve God. We're going to serve God right. And they sought him with their whole desire. Wow. Well, my desire is I want to be the CEO of this company. Or I want to get married one day. Or I want to do this. I want to go fishing and fishing season. I want to go out in the woods and hunt some deer. That's my desire. I want to make a lot of money. Uh, nothing about a desire. You want to serve God. Because if, if you, serve, you, you have a desire towards God, Maybe God will give you those things. Remember what God told Solomon? He said, listen, I'll give you a blank check. Here's my signature. Sign it. What do you want? And Solomon says, I want knowledge and I want wisdom. And God says, I like that. You weren't selfish. I'm going to tell you what, Solomon. I will give you that knowledge. I will give you that wisdom. Guess what? I'm going to give you gold. I'm going to give you silver. I'm going to make your name great. You're going to be smarter than anybody else around of all generations. But yet today, we go out for other things. We are seeking other things. And our lives are miserable. Our families are miserable. The church is miserable. Why? Because there's no desire for God. You can't get people on a Wednesday night. A lot of churches have closed their Wednesday night services. That's not a desire for God. It's not a desire for God when Benjamin Franklin is all around your city and George Washington goes into that plate. That's not a desire for God. A desire for God to be worried about your neighbors, worried about your family, worried about your co-workers, worried about that boss you hate in their souls. That's a desire for God. There's no desire for a secret Christian but to be hidden, to be unknown. Let's keep reading while well, I still have a voice. And he was found of them. That's what God thought about the whole thing. You think I was just preaching. You think I was just ranting and raving. But God said, guess what? I found you. Have you ever been lost? 
I mean, seriously, have you ever gone to a city or the woods, somewhere in your life, have you ever been that scared, like, I don't know where I am? I have, even with a GPS. And have you ever had that terror? I mean, it's like, where do I go? What do I do? There is no one to turn to. And then, something, however it came, you found your way. How did you feel? Once you knew right where you were and where to go, how did you feel at that moment? Now let me ask you, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are lost. You have no idea where you're going. I'll tell you where you're going. You're going to hell, and you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. And once you realize that Jesus Christ is your Savior, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, boy, when your heart will open up, when your soul will just sing out in praise, when your whole life now has a purpose, when it now is all about Jesus, about God, what a wonderful thing to feel that no more you don't know where you are. And if you're saved, and you got that lost in your life. And you don't know what's going on. And when the Lord comes in your life and he just cuddles you up and says, follow me. I'll get you out of this. But yet, how many Christians, now I'm not talking to the lost people. You don't know any better. I don't mean that. Listen, I'm, I mean that with love. You don't. But I'm talking about how many Christians out there will go with the pills. And yes, alcohol. And yes, smoking. Maybe legal or unlegal, yes. Or you go to somebody else. You pay somebody an outrageous fee to go tell them about your problems, which they don't have an answer anyway. And they're going to go see a psychiatrist because they're sick and tired of hearing about you and your problems. And you go through all this and there's no answers. Where the answer is here is God, listen. When you go back to these chapters from, from the half of uh, Solomon to uh, Rehoboam, all the way up to chapter 14, it's the Bible record we read today that they were in turmoil. God was giving them all kinds of things. Well, let me find it here. It says, oh boy, it says, great vexations. You might have trouble in your life today because you're not going after God. Your heart is not set on God. Your soul is not after God. You're not seeking after God. You have not sought God. He is not your desire, but something else you need to sought. You need to seek. You need to get back to God. You need to take all that junk in your life and throw it away. Then you can live chapter four, uh, 15 in Second Chronicles. Because what did it say? It said, and he, God, was found of them, verse 15. And look what God says in verse 15, at the end of the verse. And the Lord gave them rest round about. No more turmoil. No more troubles. Now again, we're in the Old Testament. Paul writes to the Christian today, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You'll suffer persecution in your own church. Believe me. He said, well, what about rest? You know, if I could tell you and sit down and tell you all the stories that God can do for me, has done for me. You know, let me tell you something. When you're, when you're witnessing on the street to people, and God gives you great things as, as you serve him, as you do right. And the devil's out there. He has, I'll say, a band. You know, they're singing music and making a joyful time. And you and a Christian brother go up and you hold your signs and you be a witness. And you tell people and you give them gospel tracts as they're leaving. And you are a witness. And when the, when the devil's people in that band, turns around and starts singing, I want Jesus, and I need to find me a little church to defame you as a Christian. But in actuality, they're preaching more than you are. When they are helping you, the devil's people, when they help you to tell people to look for Jesus and to look for a church, that the fact is a church the signs may have gone to someone's heart and here now they're singing and they're hearing that they need Jesus and they need a church. 
Wow! And you walk away from that glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And they meant it to mock you. What did it say in the book of Acts? Peter and John, or Peter and James, forget. They were beaten by the magistrates, and they walked out of that, praise the Lord, I got to be beat for Jesus. Where was Peter in the book of Acts? James just got killed. Peter's in prison, and what's he doing? He's going to be executed the next day. Peter is sitting in jail. And the Holy Spirit has to smack him on the face. Hey, will you get up? Huh? What? I'm going to heaven tomorrow. No, you're not. Oh, man. That's how you read the Bible. Have you read Paul? Have you read the second uh, Timothy chapter 4? I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I'm going to get a crown. Rest. Even in turmoil. Even in problems. Even joyfulness. I love when people at church tell me about the bumper stickers on my car. Because keep saying it. Because within two days, somebody comes up and blesses me by saying how they like the, the bumper stickers. Or they read it and we're able to give them a gospel track. Which goes into heaven, glory, great books of life. I will finish this. And also concerning my cat, my, my child. The mother of Asa, mommy, sweet mommy, Mother's Day is coming up Sunday. The, the mother of King, try this again, I'm not going to say her name again. The mother of Asa the king, he removed her from being queen. Oh, mean guy. Because she had made an idol in the grove. You know it's time to tell your family if they don't want to serve Jesus, they don't want to do what's right, you got to go. Right there. You need to go. You tell them about Jesus. You pray for them. But you have no fellowship with them. You get out of my kingdom, you get out of my house. That's what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus says that you can't be his disciple unless you hate your mother. You hate your father. You know that mean you hate them? No. You have a displeasure for them because they don't want to do right. They don't want to walk. Now I've got to finish this quickly. He made an idol. Uh, for, she had made an idol in the grove. And Asa cut down her idol and stamped it. Oh, how terrible. No, how righteous. And burnt it at the book, brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. That's a sorry thing. But that's Israel. That's northern. That is not in Asa's territory. You don't go in somebody's territory and take down their idols. You don't go into a Catholic church and destroy their idols. You don't go in someone's house and destroy their idols. You don't go in their house and say, Ah, oh, you wicked person, you got a Christmas tree. Foul, 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 foul. You no, know, listen. Love, scripture, prayer, time. Some of you think I had to go burn their Christmas tree down there. No. I wouldn't be that cruel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. Now, perfect doesn't mean 100%. That means his heart was out to serve God and do the best he can. Listen, God wants you to do the best. Even though you are a sinner, if you put your heart to it, if you try, and even if you fail, you get back up and walk again. That's what God wants from you. And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated. Silver and gold and vessels. He's returning things back to God that belongs to God. Have you ever made a prayer and offering to God that you never gave to him? Have you ever said in your life, God, if you do this, I will do this. And God did that, but you haven't done that. I hope you understand. I hope that wasn't confusing. But there was a time in your life, did, did you promise God something if God would return a favor and answer a prayer? And that prayer was answered. 
God was faithful and you weren't. You need to bring the dedicated things into the house of the Lord. But I, yeah. There was no more war unto the fifth and twenty, the fifth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. Thirty-five years. It's thirty-fifth year, and where we know it says he had chapter fourteen, verse one. He had ten years rest, quietness. Then there was a war. Oh, where was it said? When you go back and read this, I thought there was a number was mentioned. But Asa, in return, wanting to do right, wanting to with his heart, with his soul, with getting the trash out, getting Satan out, getting sin out, getting the world out, getting flesh out, God gave him peace. God gave him answered prayer. God gave him a comfort. God is working with him. Now, Asa is going to fail. Next chapter, as was pointed out to me today. But still, look at him. And not many people, even though Asa and his wife does wrong, not many people can say and do what Asa did. Can you say today, honestly, that God is walking with you, that your heart is perfect for the Lord, that your desire is to the Lord, that your motive is for the Lord, that you have gotten the gods, you have gotten the devil, you've gotten flesh, you've gotten the world out of your life. You are telling people about Jesus. You are living a life that's being persecuted by all. And you're still standing for all. And you're still praying. And you're still weeping. And we'll leave it just like that.